Good morning and um, welcome to the FinTech Wales hosted webinar this morning. Um, I'm pleased to introduce uh, this topic, which is about competing in the FinTech digital future um, against bigger and more active brands, what you can do to improve and maximize on your marketing. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you today. My name is Sarah Williams Gardner. I'm the newly appointed CEO at FinTech Wales. FinTech Wales is all about empowering the FinTech and financial services across the Welsh Principality. We were founded in 2019 as an independent uh, industry body, not-for-profit, um, an organisation that gives voice to Welsh-based FinTechs on the global stage. We speak on their behalf um, as far as the sector is concerned, we distill the opinions, the different goals and the objectives into common themes, giving the likes of government and academia the opportunity to hear these clearly in order that they can act. Our collective encourages and enables collaboration between large institutions and the smaller fintech community, from one person startup supporting an ecosystem allowing bright ideas to flourish. We do this by raising awareness here in Wales, we nurture skills and talent, we connect the community, and we empower the fintech, system, the fintech ecosystem. We endeavour to do this by supporting mentoring, events like today, networking, facilitating introductions, along with access to finance. We're currently working on the possibility of a foundry which can incubate and accelerate bright new ideas, bringing the Welsh fintech community together even closer. Here today, what we're planning to do is explore the, the tech and the, te uh, and the tactics to maximize profitability in the digital world that we're living. We're living in a very busy, noisy market. How do we compete with the established brands who seem to have very deep pockets when it comes to marketing budgets? We have two great speakers with us today who believe that, and their belief is backed up by the revelations in PwC FinTech report that increasing customer engagement and retention can be achieved um, with, with the easy to use digital tools that are out there in the market. They allow faster access to services and processes and above all, they allow you to build trust with your audience. Let me take this opportunity to introduce you to our two speakers today. Firstly, we've got Scott James, who's the Managing Director and Founding Partner at Illustrate Digital. Um, welcome, Scott. Nice to have you with us. Um, Scott works with the financial services clients, including Hodge Bank down here in Cardiff and counting up one of our smaller fintechs. He helps them to strategize and design and build their websites um, and software. He's also a very valued member of my Fintech Wales board, so it's lovely to have you here, Scott. And he's a frequent speaker on the world stage as a representative for the World Press organization. We've also got with us today um, Rachel Murray. Welcome, Rachel. Lovely to have you here with us. Um, Rachel's the Head of Partnerships at Fountain. Um, she's very passionate at driving the bottom line for business owners, something I personally like, that focus on re um, return on investment. She loves measurable results and she's very goals-based and this has led her to working with many top brands. So we're very lucky to have both of these speakers with us today. Um, firstly, I'm going to hand over to Rachel who will take us through her presentation. Just before I do that, we're aiming to take questions at the end of the session. So I would encourage you to pop them in the chat and we'll try and collate them as we go through. But let me hand you over to Rachel, um, who will share her insights. Thank you, Sarah. Lovely to see so many of you today. Challenger FinTech brands are on the rise and competition is rife. They're offering new intelligent solutions and a seamless digital experience. In response, established financial institutions are pouring endless resource into customer acquisition and retention. Both parties are regularly having to rethink their digital strategies to compete in this evolving market. I'm gonna spend the next 20 minutes sharing with you all the latest strategies and tactics that work well for our innovative challenger brand clients. This webinar is for seasoned marketeers, which I know a lot of you are, but also for those of you who are starting out on your journey. Now I wanna give you guys food for thought around short and long-term ideas for strategy and growth. So let's kick off by going back to basics. The biggest mistake in marketing is focusing on activities, not outcomes. And the most successful marketing campaigns begin with the end in mind, 
Now, too often we hear about marketing teams setting new, shiny campaigns live without any forecasting about what the results are likely to be. Digital marketing should be a forecasting spreadsheet exercise, taking you away from the traditional mad men model to math men. Not only does this forecasting process reduce risk, it also identifies investment levels and upside opportunities. Now, if you're going for investment, having a detailed spreadsheet with accurate digital forecasts in it will allow your investors to see that your online growth targets are achievable over time. During this process, you need to establish your three most important numbers. What's your cost per acquisition? You know, what are you willing to pay to acquire a new customer? Consider this in terms of customer lifetime value. What are your costs per clicks? Paid platforms will give you an indication of this. And it's also worth looking at competitor research software such as SEM Rush or SpyFu to see how aggressively your competitors are bidding. And finally, what's the conversion rate required on site to ensure your campaigns are profitable? So just a really easy example here. If the cost per acquisition is £40 and your CPCs average is say around £2, then the conversion rate required is 5%. Easy. You then need to go through each channel or activity and see which channels are viable with these figures in mind. Now, if the numbers aren't working, it's either because your CPCs are too high or your cost per acquisition is too low. And this allows you to see where the problem is in the funnel. Now, once these three numbers are established, you obviously need to set your sales targets and budget. For example, you know, if you want 1,000 new sales per month and your CPA is 150 quid, then your budget's 150,000 pounds per month. Really, really simple stuff. Now you need to start thinking about where your target audience is online. Are they on Facebook, Google, LinkedIn? Where are they most likely to respond to your advertising? Now, no matter what the answer is to this question, cost per clicks for these channels will determine whether or not they'll be profitable for your business. So cost per clicks are generally about five pence to five pounds for Facebook, one pound fifty to nine pounds for LinkedIn, and six p to two hundred pounds, shocking, I know, for Google. Now you've established your CPA and CPCs, you need to think about what the conversion rate required is to hit your targets. Now, as an example, in our experience, the average conversion rates across financial services for Google search is around 4%. So if you're thinking about this in terms of this channel alone, if your cost per clicks are £1.60 and your cost per acquisition is around £40, then you'll be able to run on Google search because the conversion rate required is 4%. You're then going to need to apply some methodology, methodology to each of these proposed channels to work out the funnel and see if they'll be profitable. Now, this includes looking at how many impressions and clicks will be generated and then using from your current clicks or inquiry conversion rates, you can work out how many leads will be received. And then your current lead to sale conversion rate, how many sales and the cost per sale. You know, marketing is all about selling the next step. So it's really important to draw out the steps to minimise risk and reduce wasted spend. So just I wanted to give you an idea about what this could look like. So I've taken some screenshots of our in-house forecasting process called the Digital Strategy Builder. And we use this to forecast each step of the process before working with any new clients. So we start off by setting targets, including sales required, lead to sale conversion rate if relevant, target cost per sale and average sales value. So from this, the strategy builder calculates our targets. So that's maximum budget, potential revenue and the target ROI. It also calculates the number of clicks and cost per clicks required to hit the targets of varying website conversion rates. We then forecast by channel. So this is an example of our paid search forecasting page. Everything's automatically generated from the target setting page. All you need to do is input the keywords, searches per month and cost per clicks from Google's keyword planner. The strategy builder will then show you how many clicks you should expect to receive, what your monthly cost will be, how many sales and your CPA. So we use a similar forecasting strategy for each channel to show clients exactly what ROI they should expect to receive. And you could do the same for your business. Now, before you set any campaigns live, it's important that you consider how you're going to measure this return on investment. According to HubSpot's 2020 stats, only 75% of marketeers are reporting on how their campaigns are directly influencing revenue. Don't be that 25% that wastes their money. It's vital that you take a full funnel approach to your digital efforts and track and optimise each stage of the sales and marketing funnel from initial website interaction all the way through to lifetime value. Now, to do this, to ensure that, that before you set, get to the traffic stage, 
you need to make sure that all goal tracking attribution is set up correctly so that your marketing data is being recorded reliably and accurately. Now, I know you seasoned marketers already have this covered, but you'd actually be surprised at how many fintech brands haven't set this up properly or they focus purely on lead volume over profitability. There are two vital things that you need to do to set up tracking correctly. So number one is ensure you have accurate UTM tracking. A UTM code is a snippet of simple code that you can ask the end of a URL to track performance of campaigns and content. Most advertising platforms will give you the option to add dynamic tracking templates to avoid manual input, which is good because that would take you a very long time otherwise. So doing this correctly allows you to begin to dig into your sales funnel to understand which audiences and targeting are generating the highest return on investment. And then secondly, you need to collect the unique ad identifiers for offline conversion data. So for those users that don't complete the transaction online or need a little nudge from the sales team, you should use offline conversion tracking by collecting the unique ad identifiers, such as GCLIS, short for Google Click Identifiers. So this is a unique tracking parameter that you can import back into the advertising platform to indicate a transaction has been completed. You know, this closes the net on your sales data and allows in-platform profitability analysis down to a keyword level, which is really, really important. Once you've done this, you can see which keywords are bringing you the highest lifetime value customers. You can run a regular 80-20 analysis by doing this. The Pareto principle states that for many events, roughly 80% of the effects come from 20% of the causes. And this applies particularly to keywords as a small number of top performing keywords will achieve the greatest returns. Once you've established these, I recommend creating separate campaigns for these high performing keywords for a greater level of control. And also make sure you're writing as specifically for each ad group within those campaigns. And of course, continue to test ad copy to increase click through rate on an ongoing basis. Now, there are other ways of measuring campaigns with softer metrics, such as for brand building campaigns. Now, brand building is often neglected because marketers don't see immediate results or they find it difficult to track ROI. In my opinion, performance marketers need to reposition how they think about this. Now, back in 2015, hardly anyone had heard of Monzo, but they focused so heavily on investing in their brand building campaigns that they're one of the most widely recognized challenger banks in the UK. Google recently created a solution that allows you to measure brand lift from display and video campaigns. Now, brand lift is a measurement of the direct impact your video and display ads are having on perceptions and behaviors throughout your consumer's journey. So within a matter of days, brand lift gives you insights into how your ads impact the, met the metrics that matter. Now, this includes, like as you can see on the screen, ad recall, brand awareness, consideration, favorability, and purchase intent, the most important one. You can easily optimize your campaigns within two weeks based on these near real-time results. So how does Google do this? So in order to measure this, Google does this in a couple of ways. So firstly, through surveys, they isolate a randomized control group that wasn't shown your ad and, exp and an exposed group that did see your ad. So after a day has passed, they deliver one question surveys to both groups. So since the only difference between the two is one saw your ad and one didn't, they can accurately determine the lift attributed to your campaigns. Brand lift will also measure the impact your campaigns have on creating interest in your brand by using organic search data from both Google and YouTube. Now, quite similar to surveys, they randomly pick a group that saw your ad and one that didn't. Then they compare the organic search behavior of both groups, you know, looking at how they search for keywords related to your brand. The different searches can then be attributed to your efforts. The responses are then gathered and computed as early as two weeks into a campaign, like I said before. You know, and finally, the performance marketeers can start to show some fast, measurable results from display and video like never before. So if you take an example of a YouTube campaign, just to give you an idea of what you'll be able to find out, you're going to be able to determine elements such as do people recall watching my ad? You know, are target customers more favorably aligned with my brand's identity? And most importantly, are customers intending to purchase my product or service? You can still measure and see uplifts in the, of the primary and secondary KPIs listed here, such as lead and sales volume increase over time or website traffic increase. You're likely to see an uplift in this, say, over a six month period, in my experience, whereas the brand lift results can fulfill the need for short term results. OK, so you forecast a return investment from your campaigns and you're geared up to track them effectively. It's now time to focus on your customer experience. 
Of course, as you all know, there's no point spending your budget on advertising if you're offering a poor customer experience when users land on your website. As we all know, as challenger brands grow, scaling the superior customer experience that attracted their customers in the first place isn't always easy. The stakes are high when it comes to providing excellent service amid growth because consumers know they can go elsewhere. You need to be able to respond to the data gleaned from customers' interactions rapidly, identifying the breaks in the customer journey, and then addressing them as quickly as possible before they've turned into a major problem. Now, one way to do this is through conversion rate optimization. This is a no media spend strategy that's guaranteed to increase revenue over time if it's implemented correctly. Again, I assume most of you in this space were already doing this, but a quick outline of our approach for you. Now, firstly, we review the current user behavior on the website in Google Analytics and your existing tracking platforms, as well as putting user rec recording software on the site. Now, I say Hotjar is easily the best tool for this, but you can use others such as Session Cam, for example. We use Hotjar's recording data, heat maps and surveys to see where the users are going, what they're having trouble with, if they're missing key bits of information, and most importantly, why they're not converting. Now, using this data, we create bespoke testing roadmaps, which highlights test ideas that aim to improve user experience and increase goal completions. And finally, we A-B split tests using software such as Visual Website Optimizer or Google Optimize to increase conversion on an ongoing basis. Now, one of the issues you might be identifying during your analysis is that your requirement to gather all the necessary user information via extensive website forms is causing users to drop out of the funnel. So just an example of a story, like we had a client who had a great back end piece of software that reduced admin time for IFAs, but on the front end of the website, they sought to gather as much user information as possible, which led to a large amount of drop offs. In my opinion, the form almost seemed like it was never going to end. There's a balance to be struck between hitting the conversion rate target you need and gathering enough user information. If you need to keep the extensive form, the key is to making it as fast and easy to use as possible. You know, let the users know how long it's going to take, keep the technical jargon to a minimum, limit the questions on each page, and of course, tell the users how many steps in the process are left. You know, conversion boosts could come as something as simple as uh, taking the phone number requirement off the first page of the form. The less the user has to fill in and the less commitment they feel during the initial form stage, the better. Another point where users often drop off the stages are around compliance. Now, compliance alone isn't enough to sustain and grow a business. And if compliance tops everything else, you run the risk of losing your customers in a web of complex, albeit compliant, processes. We regularly see a user's journey being interrupted with a complex list of rules, caveats, and exclusions. It's in jargon they don't understand, it's long, it's boring, and so the user journey leaves, especially in the B2C fintech space. Compliance should be bedded into the user journey in plain language, asterisks where relevant, and with clear info links. You know, these info links also help evoke trust in your brand because you're addressing questions and concerns really early on in the process. I'd actually recommend A-B split testing this messaging as often as possible. You'll be able to see which wording evokes a positive reaction and leads to a higher conversion rate. Compliance actually doesn't need to be the enemy here. So compliance tools can actually influence your approach to improving CX. So for example, complex management systems capture every customer interaction, resulting in information being in a centralized place. So not only does this provide the levels of tr transparency required for say, robust compliance, but it furnishes businesses with a uni unified single view of the customer, which can be used to influence all aspects of your online presence. If you get compliance being integrated into your user journey right, then your website is going to provide useful, relevant information to your customers. Search engines place a huge emphasis on high quality pages. So, for example, Google uses page quality ratings to evaluate how well a web page achieves its purpose. And much like financial regulations, websites should be designed to benefit your users, not mislead them. Financial institutions also fall under the your money, your life page category for Google. So Google defines fintech websites as those that can impact the future happiness, health, financial stability or safety of users. And therefore, Google has a very high standard for these pages. However, if your dropout funnel percentage is still higher than you'd like, or your business model doesn't allow you to change your current processes, I recommend using remarketing to mark up any users who have dropped out and encourage them to return and complete the process. 
So with free impressions and clicks as low as 10 pence, remarketing is a really cost-effective channel for maximizing conversions and keeping your brand front of mind in a positive way. You can also actually just pay per conversion rather than paying per clicks. So that's guaranteed you're going to get a good return on investment. Remarketing works by creating a list of visitors who have been to a certain page on your website. And this is often to show people ads about the product they were viewing to encourage them to return and complete an action. It also creates an excellent opportunity to increase the lifetime value of existing customers by moving them from one product funnel to another. Now, this is especially relevant for fintechs, where the products might become relevant to customers at different stages of their lives. You can do remarketing on multiple platforms, including Google, Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn and YouTube. You know, a high conversion rate for these adverts is expected due to the users already being familiar with your brand. So for those of you who have visited Fountain's website, I hope you're interested in what we do because remarketing ads can follow you for up to full, a full 540 days, which is obviously a very long time. But fear not, we practice what we preach, which is to regularly change ads to avoid banner blindness and continue to offer users valuable content so your brand stays front of mind in a positive way. So in summary, Always establish the three most important numbers and forecast first to reduce risk. Take a full funnel approach to marketing and track where your most profitable customers are coming from. Use the Google's brand lift tool that I mentioned to measure results from display and video campaigns. Find a balance between hitting the on-site conversion rate target you need and gathering enough user information. Integrate compliance into your user journey. Use simple jargon and split test that messaging to see which wording leads to an increased conversion rate. And finally, use remarketing to capture users who have dropped out of your conversion funnel. So I hope that all listeners got something of value out of the points that I've addressed today. And I'll be happy to answer any questions, uh, as Sarah said, later on in the presentation. And you can contact me via the details in this slide. Thank you very much. Wow, Rachel, that was um, that was fantastic, and some really clear messages there. I mean, personally, I think the um, the comparison between Mad Men and Maths Men, and I've personally seen a lot of that. You know, we 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 have seen the painful focus on analytics, on data, on return on investment, and I think that came across really clearly in what you were saying. I love the I love the metrics. I'll have to re-watch them to work some of them through but thank you very much for sharing all of that insight with, with a huge amount of energy um, let's move on to scott um putting him on the on the spot now to uh to be energetic from what i always think looks like his space station office um scott thank hand you very much and yeah that's uh, gosh rachel that's difficult to follow i think but um i'm uh hoping to to sort of follow that on with okay people are now um, at your website, essentially, what do we now get them to do? Uh, and, and what are the things that we need to sort of have nailed down to make sure that we um, we really accelerate the marketing um, of, of the, your fintech brand or financial service brand? Um, so uh, without further ado, so of the top 100,000 websites in the world in terms of traffic, 45% of those use the WordPress platform. I'm not here to sort of I am, and I'm not sell the WordPress platform to you to a degree, um, but I do have a bit of a, a sort of narrative behind this. So if you narrow it down now to the top um, 10,000 websites, the figure lifts um, to 49%, and that's increasing. The, the closest competitor to the world's most popular content platform is Drupal, um, and that has got just over, I have completely lost my mouse. There we go. Um, sorry about that. I've lost everything. There we go. Sorry. Um, so yeah, the the closest uh, to the the world's biggest 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 competitor is uh, Drupal, with just over seven percent of market share, and that's actually teetering on decline. Um, in my in addition to my role as the managing director of Illustrate Digital, which is the user experience and WordPress development agency for ambitious brands, um, I'm also involved with the marketing team at WordPress, and I get to see and work on some of the key driving forces behind the success of the world's most popular content management platform and understand what it make, what makes it such a crucial tool for marketers across the world when producing successful web builds and campaigns. This pursuit of knowledge in how to design the best experiences and engineer the most useful functionalities has taken my team all across the UK, Europe, and also America in search of the answer to what, what is every, every marketer's desire. Uh, we've tested platforms, developed technologies, designed more websites than you could shake a stick at, 
And it may then be fair to say we know a little bit about content management. But my ultimate question is, what do the majority of the top 100,000 or top 10,000 brands in the world know that we can learn from today? There's got to be a reason that the highest performing websites perform as well as they do, whilst also uh, being a completely free uh, content management uh, system. So we're going to explore the top 15 things that every marketer or every brand needs to have or should benefit from when it comes to their content management management platform. So I've promised you the top 15 hits of our time in marketing. So let's get stuck in um, at number one. Um, number one is a clear intentional navigation. And this could be the most obvious of all of my points. But if people arrive at your website, your campaign landing page and can't find the content or information that interests them, then you've already begun a losing battle. As a marketer, it's your responsibility to plan out your content in advance and understand the routes that your users may want to take to find that content. It's your content platform's responsibility and equally your web agency's responsibility to make sure that your navigation is accessible, both on the front end of your website for visitors and in the back end for content managers. An intuitive, easy to manage interface to update your navigation as your brand evolves is absolutely crucial in this. Um, it's not just about you know, it being delivered to you and that's the end of that. It is, it should be constantly evolving as you evolve as a brand. In addition, you should seek even clearer mobile navigation. So on screen here, we've got an example from, um, uh, you know, slightly out of, um, out of industry example, but uh, one of our clients, Ladybird Education, um, have a really, really clear mobile navigation. So just to hammer home the first point, but also to draw your attention to different device sizes, you really need to aim for even clearer and more intuitive navigation on smaller devices. Um, and this is where you need to be a little bit more careful, especially if your website houses a lot of content. Don't allow the navigation to go too deep on mobile. Um, that little side menu, menu can get a little bit fiddly when you get two or uh, three options deep. Number two uh, is intuitive horizontal scroll on mobile. And uh, again, just to focus on how someone experiences your content on smaller devices, websites built in 2020 and, and onwards should really be considering horizontal scroll on mobile devices. What do I actually mean by that? Well, you've definitely visited the web, a, a website in the past on your mobile phone, and it's felt like a never ending scrolling experience. Uh, and if people have to scroll really far to find your content, especially factoring in short attention spans, you're very likely going to lose them. Organizing the experience by content type is a really good way to give the user more control over whether they explore the content further or continue scrolling to find more of your content. It's a bit of a misnomer that you want to take control for the user and, and websites um, jar against users that actually take the control away from them. Um, and it speaks of mistrust a little bit in some cases. On the flip side though, handing control to the user even subconsciously shows the care you've given toward personalizing their relationship with your site. Um, one example I always go back to on this is Airbnb, um, and they have a really, really good way of organizing the, the you know, hundreds of thousands of pieces of content that they've got on their site. So if you're looking for a good example of that, Airbnb is a really top example, and they constantly change and constantly evolve. Number three would be content flow. Um, once you've gotten people to the content that they want to see, what happens next? Well, if we're talking about successful marketing, and obviously we are, uh, what are the, one of two things is gonna happen. Either the website visitor is gonna be so engaged in the content that they fill out a contact form, uh, reach out to you or purchase one of your products, or this is more likely, they, see, they need to see a little bit more information before they're totally convinced. So let's just look at two scenarios really quickly. The first scenario is an e-commerce website. Um, selling high-end fashion, your visitor successfully navigates from menswear to shoes, shoes to brown brogues, and from this category, they're able to open a product that they likely like the look of. Um, is the journey complete? The chances are no, the first product they've looked at isn't the product they will actually buy, at least not straight away. So you show them other brown brogues they may like to see. They browse through several pairs of shoes before deciding upon one that they like the most, and eventually they purchase your product. So that's quite a familiar scenario that we're all sort of used to. And the example on screen here is John Lewis. So I wanted to give you a bit of a, you know, we, we like, you know, something we regularly do. Something a little bit more specific in the second scenario is a website offering a range of specialist finance solutions to businesses looking to lend money to buy a property. 
So your visitor navigates to the solution they think is most relevant to them. They engage with your content and are interested in what you can offer. However, they've never heard of you before and they need to build up a little bit of trust. So you show them a range of case studies of other businesses in similar scenarios that have used the solution to purchase a commercial property. Um, they browse through several case studies and decide you are a credible lender before engaging with you by filling out an inquiry form. In both scenarios, in two completely different industries, you've rightly assumed that the customer isn't quite ready to purchase and provided an opportunity for them to continue flowing through your content um, and, and find uh, the most relevant channels um, to, to that end result. Number four would be personalization, and this ties in very nicely with content flow, um, especially if we're talking about visitors taking the most relevant channels. Personalization allows you to build up a picture of what your website visitors are most interested in and serve the most relevant content back to them. And this is a really, really crucial thing for 2020 and 2021 and, and beyond. Um, people are tired of seeing the same content over and over again or just being delivered the same uh, experience and it's not as relevant to them. So it works because the more relevant the experience, the more relevant your brand appears to each person viewing your website. There are two main ways to deliver personalized content to your audience. Both methods require a little bit of information gathering first um, before you can really get moving. The first way is to store a cookie in your user's browser, which identifies the types of uh, categories of content that they've been looking at on your site. Um, the more visits they make, the more data builds up, and the more personalized the content is going to become for them. The second is a little bit less personal, but uses collective data to understand what your audience prefers generally speaking. It's also a little bit more complicated, but here's the way we like to do it. So implementing a tool such as Algolia to allow users to search a website, um, you can collect data on the types of content that people prefer collectively. You're essentially gathering uh, data to prove that people who typically search for retirement mortgages, for example, also search for annuities. And therefore, anyone browsing content related to retirement mortgages should be shown content related to annuities. Personalization is essentially content flow on another level. Whichever method you choose, it can be a really powerful tool to help drive more leads or purchases via your website. Number five is one that's um, particularly close to my heart in terms of marketing and is one that we use quite well and quite successfully at Illustrate Digital. Um, how do you create some of the most relevant content that gets shown as a result of personalization and content flow? Well, a better question still is actually, how do you rank well for keywords in your industry that very few other people are ranking for? And, and that the helpful answer and genuine answer that your audience is actually asking as well in, in terms of search. A content hub is a really, really powerful marketing tool and sometimes a really quick way of helping you to achieve a page one ranking or even a Google snippet um, in, in search results. Uh, and this is by producing and publishing really useful content. For me, content hubs are like the hidden secret of the marketing world, to be honest. Um, across our client base from law firms, banks, tech brands, we've experienced considerable success in creating space for brands to explain products and services in more detail and address the concerns of their respective marketplaces. Number six is brand continuity, and this uh, leads us smoothly on to, to how to make your brand nice and continuous throughout your experience. Publishing repeatable content is an incredibly easy way to keep good continuity um, from blog posts, team members, um, con you know, content hubs like we've just spoken about. But what about when it comes to pages where you have a little bit more or perhaps a lot more free reign of building those pages? And the old guard of content management systems were notorious for letting you just do whatever the heck you wanted uh, and leaving you to figure it out. Um, you most likely remember or perhaps are still dealing with trying to get your text to stop surrounding an image you just put on a page, somehow get it to display on the front end of your website without looking completely weird. You know what I'm talking about, the image left text, right, can I get it here, can I get it there sort of thing going on. A good content management system, though, designed and engineered in collaboration with a good web agency should give you all the scope to create your own content whilst critically maintaining brand integrity and brand continuity. What do I actually mean by that? Well, for example, the WordPress platform now has the Gutenberg block editor. and The editor allows us to create block options such as an image, a bunch of text and a call to action, all with options that align to your brand. So this example on screen right now, the images that you see 
are purely that the 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 uh, the content editor will upload the images, um, but the content management system is is deciding how to treat those images and keep it consistent with your brand. So everything you see there in terms of like color and icons and, and sort of brand recognition perspective is done on the user's behalf. So when built properly, you can't run away with and add a bright you know neon green button to a section with a rich red background. Um, and you're also not going to worry about where the text and the images sit on the page. So no more pasting random HTML code into a page in the hopes that things will finally line themselves up properly. Number seven, uh, flexibility and control over content. Does having content editor with con uh, continuity in mind mean that you're going to you know, end up with a rigid experience? It, it really shouldn't mean that. And likewise, the most kind, useful kind of CMS uh, shouldn't leave you reliant upon your web agency to change things for you. This may be number nine on the list, but as far as uh, sort of this talk goes today, I would say it's possibly one of the most important things that you should be looking for in a CMS, especially if you view your web platform as an asset to your brand. Too often, I think uh, I, I speak to too many marketers and hear things such as, I can't update my navigation, or I need to ask my agency update, to update their text on the homepage. And these sort of conversations are not the sign of a, of a good content management platform that's implemented well. The power of your content management as a marketer or website owner should really be in your hands. Um, point number eight is landing page creation. Um, along very similar lines uh, and still talking about the control and flexibility you have with your website, are you able to create your own campaign landing pages? And this goes off the back of what Rachel's just been talking about. If you're currently in the process of planning a website, please make sure you factor in landing pages so that you can get the best out of your marketing campaigns. Doing it well will allow you to create the most relevant content for the campaign you're running. And if creating a PPC ad on Google, for example, that you, that's about a specific service you offer with control over your landing pages, you can ensure the content of the unique page for that campaign aligns perfectly with the content of your advert. Your visitor really should feel like they've landed on the content they were looking for and not on a random landing page of your website. And I, we see this far too often. It's just landing pages are just the home page or, or a random service page. Um, and, and viewing semi-relevant content will actually drive up your cost per click and it will drive down the level of engagement with your ads. So uh, you know, use, use things like uh, conversion rate optimization, the, the, the sorts of things that Rachel's just spoken about. Number nine is a quick one, which is video. Um, and on the subject of landing pages, uh, are you actually using video? Uh, statistics would actually suggest that using video on your website to explain your product or service can increase your conversion rates by 100%. Um, and who wouldn't like to double the amount of inquiries they have on their site? I do have a caveat when it comes to video, though, which is make sure video is controllable and not forced upon your audience. Um, the use of clickable video is much more likely to engage people fully, especially when there's audio to accompany it. But if you you know try and avoid auto playing video and especially uh, auto playing audio, I've I've definitely been caught out a few times with my volume on max uh, and a video on a website when I wasn't expecting it to start start sort of blasting out an advert. Um, and of course, there's there's performance based reasons uh, for not auto playing video as well um, and serving them from a third party platform. So. Don't overload your, your website pages. Um, number 10 is uh, calls to action. Um, any good website, in my experience, will feature at least one strong call to action. Um, but websites that seem to perform at a greater level are those with regular opportunities to convert. This might seem like a simple thing. Um, we don't want to shove the same call to action in front of the user repeatedly. Um, the way around this, though, is to ensure that you have a variable design for your call to action in order to just subtly remind the user and give them regular opportunities to convert from someone who's browsing to someone who's actually engaging with you as a brand. Um, a call to action, by the way, doesn't need to be an inquiry. It can be a newsletter or event sign up. Um, it could be a click through to another page, but ultimately it's with the aim of converting them to a paying customer later down the line after several engagements with your brand. Um, quick one on mobile calls to action as well. A lot of people sort of miss this out but you can have the opportunity and you can just see on screen here at the moment, the ability to just place a simple call to action on mobile that can follow the user around and can change depending on the types of content uh, that they're looking at as well. 
Number 11 is performance. And this might seem like a really simple point to make, but your website has to be one of the highest performing uh, possible to be one of the highest performers in terms of marketing. Um, I'm talking about site speed, of course, and we've already talked a little bit about attention spans earlier on, particularly on mobile devices. Google has put a lot of effort into making sure that developers and marketers alike um, respect the experience that someone has when using your website. Um, a lot of it comes down to how quickly your content is served to users on a device. And Google PageSpeed Insights is one of the tools that we use at Illustrate, as well as the Google Lighthouse report, um, which essentially uses the same algorithm, the same tool, um, and, and decides, basically shows how Google ranks your website and rates it from a, from a, a performance perspective. Um, we know that it's a ranking factor for Google, um, but the world's biggest search engine in our experience, uh, it actually prioritizes um, experience of the user and whatever is best for the user. And performance definitely plays into that. Number 12 is on-site SEO. From your content management system, You know, we talked earlier on about uh, the power being in your hands from a content perspective, and it's equally as important um, for your level of control of your search engine optimization from within your content management platform. Granted, there are a lot of external tools to both feed into and monitor your SEO performance, but nothing quite influences your content like the platform that it's hosted on. And the most used and perhaps most well-known on-site SEO tool in the world is Yoast SEO. Unsurprisingly, it's also the most installed plugin in the entire WordPress ecosystem, and it's our recommended go-to tool for ensuring that um, on a page-by-page -page basis, your content is built to perform. Um, there are a few absolutely crucial things that I would say you need from your on-site SEO tool, and these are influence over page titles, page descriptions, the ability to change your images shown on social media posts on a platform uh, and page-by-page -page basis, um, and a simple way to benchmark your content against keywords for that page. Finally, the last thing I would say is benchmarking the readability of your content to make sure it benefits as a wider audience as possible. Um, and this is also built into Yoast SEO. In fact, everything I've said there is built into the Yoast SEO tool. Number 13, um, very quick one, but I would say well-structured URLs uh, are absolutely crucial. And one way to throw your search engine potential completely out of the window um, is to mess up your URL structure. Um, URLs should follow a natural hierarchy for your content. Um, subservices should be nestled beneath services and so on. So to phrase it in a different way, if you leave all your website content on the highest level URL, you're actually telling both Google and your website audience that all of your content is, is, is as important as other pieces of content. So in other words, without a clear hierarchy, there's no way to properly understand or prioritize what each page of your website is actually for and what it relates to. Almost all good CMS platforms allow you to control the URL structure and create a clear hierarchy. Number 14, and we're coming towards the end now, um, is a good footer, a very simple one again, but I'm a really big fan. Uh, you're probably gonna laugh at this, but I'm a really big fan um, of a good footer. Um, but I think people miss and like, actually underestimate the footer of a website. Um, as website users, it's actually one of my, uh, and as a website user myself, one of my go-to tools when I'm looking to find something out about a brand. Um, usually something a little bit obscure, like a data retention policy or information about the leadership team. Um, but when it comes to website footers, uh, to give them a little bit more perspective, I like to refer to them as content assurance. And this is especially important in financial service and fintech brands around um, just assuring people that, you know, you've written and displayed content that gives your users um you know, a feeling of trustworthiness from both brands big and small. Use it for ways to get help to explain your equality and diversity policies, outline delivery schedules, anything you feel may give more assur assurance to your audience. Um, and, and, you know, things like key industry accreditations as well. Um, and last but not least is uh, accessibility. So, uh, you know, let me ask a sort of rhetorical question, but um, how high or low is the barrier to entry for your website when it comes to your users? Does it include as many people as possible as part of the experience? Unfortunately, as many, many people still actually overlook accessibility as one of the absolute foundations and proving points of a good website. And they sort of put accessibility into this box of just disability. But really, you should be actively aiming to include as many users as you possibly can, um, whilst, of course, still creating a great, vibrant experience. 
Um, it's it's often, like I say, seen as sort of a the category of disability, but in reality, it's a case of allowing um, as many different people as possible to access as much of your content as pos as they possibly can, and in turn, actually allowing people to engage with your brand. Um, and of course, it's worth mentioning and there's a legal implication to poor website accessibility and more and more cases are being brought to courts across the world and in the UK for brands who haven't actively considered accessibility as part of the website testing process. Our recommendation is at the very least you should aim to meet AA, AA accessibility standards um, and details of those can be found at um, w3.org. Um, that's pretty much it from me. Um, I'm going to hand back over to Sarah and I think we've got some Q&As but obviously if you've got any questions about uh, anything we've talked about here today or anything like that please reach out to Fintech Wales or reach out to Illustrate Digital and um, we'll be more than happy to help with anything CMS content management related. Thank you. Scott thank you and um, it's, it's very reassuring that our website is in very good hands um, with yourself helping us with that so uh, so thank you and I couldn't agree with you more you know you talked about readability um you you know you talked about putting um video on I completely agree with you not one that automatically plays we've all been in that awful situation where it's blasted out in the wrong um, circumstances um but you know Rachel also talked about clear language using pure English you know we are talking about a world that is heavily regulated and it can be very difficult but personal experience, and I think I heard it from both of you, and I would encourage anybody who's putting content out, personal experience is when you get a multidisciplinary team together to talk about the end goal, you can often achieve a message that is much more readable in pure English, plain English, um, than would traditionally have been the case. And I think with the, with the rise of fintechs, we have really seen the style of communicating in this financial world as having changed. And, and it's not compromising any of the regulation. No one would do that. Financial services is a very serious industry, um, but we are doing that in a more readable way um, using video or just really netting down to, um, to plain English. So there was a combination of loads of stuff there. I certainly have, have learned a lot. Um, whilst we've got a very quiet audience, we haven't got some questions in the chat, that gives me the opportunity to ask the questions that I want to ask. So um, if you're both okay with me doing that, that's what I would I'd like to do. And, and Rachel, I'm going to come to you first. Um, and th there's two or three questions in, the, in this one statement, but, you know, pick them apart and, and, and come back to me with your answers. You know, I've heard that there's a minimum budget required for a Google brand lift tool. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah, it is correct. So I've been asked this a few times recently. So the minimum amount required depends on what country you're in, but obviously for the UK, you'll need to spend a minimum of around seven and a half K across a week in order to gather enough data and qualify for the tool. Now, I know that seems like quite a lot to some businesses, especially sort of startups, but it's well worth investing in it for the sort of data insights that you gather early on in the process. I mean, that sounds right. That helps. At the end of the day, you know, it, whilst it might seem um, like a significant amount, it's better than just stabbing blindly in the dark. It comes back to, I think, the the um, approach that you've been talking about, which is the targeted approach. So know how much you want to get out uh, and, and understand how much you're going to put in there. Um, where, where would I go to find um, the data to do the, the forecasting approach that you've mentioned? And, and also when I'm doing that, how far back would you encourage me to go? Mm. Okay, so thinking about your first question, where to get sort of the data for the forecasting. Okay, there's plenty of places you can get it from. So first of all, you probably start off by looking at audience tools for the social platforms. So, you know, this their forecasting tools will give you an indication of other metrics such as uh, expected cost per clicks, budget required, uh, and a range of expected click through rates, as well as most importantly, the audience size. Uh, Google's Keyword Planner, provides a number of searches and average CPC ranges that I showed you with the digital strategy builder slides. You just pop them in there. Um, and as I mentioned earlier on the presentation as well, so you can use competitor tools such as SpyFu or SEMrush to see top line overviews of your competitors' data. 
Uh, and then I suppose, of course, if you're if you're with a premier partner agency, then your in-house team will have access to or, or your in-house team. Uh, actually, if you qualify for a certain level of Google support, you're going to have access to uh, various data and vertical trends and insights from Google themselves, which can be really helpful. So for your other question, you said how far back would you have That's to analyze right. so your data? You get Is that the right, best Sarah? Return on the keywords, etc. Yeah, yeah. So that's sort of going back to like the full funnel approach. So it depends on what your offering is in this space. But I'd normally recommend analyzing sort of a couple of years worth of data if you can. Uh, your high return keywords might have changed in like the pandemic. So it's actually worth analyzing your short term data as well at the moment. Obviously, if you're a startup, you can't do the full funnel approach initially. But, you know, I recommend getting all the foundations in place, such as the goal tracking solutions that I mentioned earlier. So you are able to do that later on down the line. Rachel, that's really, really helpful. Thank you for, for bringing those in. Um, Scott, if you're OK for me just to come to you with a couple of questions. Um, going into the next 12 months, what would you say is the number one web trend that we should all be considering right now? I, I would I would go back to what I said earlier on in the, in the slides in terms of um, personalization. I think that is uh, is the number one thing that if you look at what people aren't doing enough of and what we should be doing more of into into uh, 2021, I would say that that would be exactly it. Um, you you can see it in sort of you know normal real world scenarios. Anything from sort of you know your your sky box at home is now serving you ads based on. The shopping you do in Tesco, for example, um, and you know Channel Four app uh, on your smart TV is showing you the the things that it knows that you like and that you want to you want to watch and you want to see. Um, it's no different from a website perspective, and in fact, it should be even more important in that perspective. We know and recognise it in e-commerce, and that's where we we expect to see it. But we, I think, not enough brands and a particularly financial service and fintech brands have yet applied it really well to. Um, to their website uh, content, um, and it's it's actually a really simple feedback loop and feedback network to sort of get uh, get get up and running. Scott, thank thank you very much for that. Now, just let me talk to you about WordPress, and I know you're a big advocate of um, of WordPress, which I, I you know not questioning is a great CMS tool, um, but there are some CTOs out there that have a little bit of resistance to it. Um, what, if any, are the security concerns of using this platform? I absolutely love questions like this because uh, this comes up quite a lot. And um, something that I do is actually regularly speak on the benefits of the WordPress platform and how to sell it into enterprise brands and, and, and that sort of uh, thing. Um, for us, it, I think proof is in the pudding to some extent. You know, we've got we've got banks and financial service brands running on the WordPress platform. So if we can go through their vetting processes uh, and and meet their security standards, then you know happy days to some extent there. Um, but actually, I think the history of that and where people have um, got a bit of a question mark over WordPress is purely it's the the broadness of the marketplace that it works in. You can use it from a very very tiny brand startup brand who can use it any way they want to host it on a really bad platform that doesn't have good security standards. Uh, right through to the enterprise brand, brands and the banks. Um, I think because both ends of the spectrum can use what is actually a really simple foundational platform, a lot of the market have, have not implemented it well. and Another part of the market have implemented it really well. There's only really, to be perfectly honest with you, about eight brands in the UK that I, I personally would, in terms of agencies, that I personally would trust to actually build something of really high quality security standards in WordPress. So. It is a specific thing, but for me, beauty is in the eye of the beholder to some extent there. If you've got an agency that can implement it really well, has really high standards, then security is not an issue whatsoever. Um, if you're using it in a general sense without that specific knowledge, that's when it starts to become a bit of a concern, and a bit of an issue. So that would be the difference sort of between high and low security when it comes to the platform. But it's no different. I could say the exact same thing for any any CMS platform. Yeah. And, and as you said, you know, we are seeing this being used in the fintech financial services sector, which has high security requirements, very understandably so. Um, and we're heartened by that as, as customers of those brands um, going through those sites. So thank you for that. We're just reaching the hour. 
Um, so I'm going to take this opportunity to thank uh, both Scott and Rachel for their time this morning. Um, if you're anything like me, I think I'll go back and listen over some of those points that they um, both made. I think there was a lot of content that was shared today. So thank you very much for that. And also, I'm just going to give a quick shout out to Emily, who's behind the scenes and managing everything for us. So thank you very much for attending. If you want to know anything more about FinTech Wales, please visit our website. Um, follow me on Twitter. Um, Rachel and Scott can also be found through the Fountain website or the Illustrate Digital website. So thank you for joining us and we're happy to engage with you offline after this event. Thank you.